Hello, my name is Sharon McDonald. I'm here representing the medicine class of 1972, and I'm pleased to introduce to you the Arnold Neymark Lecture in Medicine and Society. Our speaker today is Dr. James Blanchard. Dr. Blanchard is a graduate from the University of Manitoba, started doing some work in family practice, and then moved on to public health. He continued his education at Johns Hopkins University in the United States, attaining his PhD, and from there has moved on to global health. He has a chair in epidemiology and global health here, a Canada Health Research Chair. As well, he's a director of the Global Public Health Institute here at the University of Manitoba. Jamie and his colleagues are known really across the world in many countries where they have worked and continue to work. We're very pleased to have him speak to you today about global health and public health. Dr. Blanchard. Thank you, Sharon. It's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I still recall when you contacted me out of the blue as I was either heading to Johns Hopkins University or was already there or something like that. And um, cooked up a deal that brought me back to Manitoba eventually to uh, get involved in public health. And so thanks for, thanks for that and for continuing to support. Before I begin, um, I wish to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Personally, and as a faculty member of the University of Manitoba, I respect the treaties that were made on these territories, I acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and I'm dedicated to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. It's really a great honor for me to deliver this year's class of 1972 Arnold Neymark Lecture in Medicine and Society. I graduated from this medical school 35 years ago during Dr. Neymark's tenure as the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Manitoba. His contributions to the university, to our, pro to our province and to academia and science in Canada have been immense. Over the past several years, I've had the privilege of engaging with Dr. Neymark in relation to the development of our Institute for Global Public Health and gained a new appreciation for his commitment to ensuring that academia makes a significant contribution to society and that those of us who work in academic institutions actively seek ways to engage in service to the wider society. They all remembered the sirens. They all remembered the sirens. Over the past three weeks, I was in India, meeting the leaders of a large public health program being implemented through the University of Manitoba's Institute for Global Public Health and our partner organization, the India Health Action Trust. During our first meeting in Lucknow, team members reflected on their experiences working through the devastating wave of COVID from April through June in the North, in North Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. At the peak of the wave, the normally crowded streets full of honking cars and motorcycles had gone mostly silent, except for the sirens. All day and all night, they recounted ambulance teams urgently searching for available hospitals to transport patients with COVID, too often reaching too late. Throughout the crisis, our team continued to support the government of Uttar Pradesh in its efforts to understand the epidemic, to plan the response, and to support health workers from the villages to the hospitals to provide services. Our team developed a highly efficient surveillance system to track the epidemic and the healthcare burden helped the government to, to develop a supply chain for necessary medical equipment and resources, and to support and train health workers to manage COVID patients and to try to deliver other health services safely during the pandemic. Meanwhile, many were trying to cope with COVID infection personally or among family and friends, and they supported each other, providing medical advice and arranging services 
for team members and their families, and providing other practical, social, and emotional support. In that meeting hall, they expressed their genuine thanks to each other and to the India Health Action Trust and the University of Manitoba for supporting them during this difficult time. And they mourned for family members or friends and for four colleagues who had succumbed to COVID in recent months. Ramesh in Bangalore, Anjani in Agra, Ria in Lucknow, Sumrana in Pilibit. At the time, I was acutely aware of the privilege I've had to work with such a skilled and dedicated team and for a university that supports this work, that supports these people. My career in global public health began with another pandemic. I first became aware of the University of Manitoba's work in global health when I was a, BC, a BSc medical student in Bob Brunham's laboratory, just above us here in the Basic Medical Sciences Building. I was at the time studying the immune, the immune response to chlamydia trachomatis, and I often heard of the university's research on sexually transmitted infections in Nairobi, Kenya, led by Alan Ronald and Frank Plummer. Soon, the research team in Nairobi discovered that a high proportion of the women in sex work and their clients that visited the STI clinics in Nairobi were living with a new uh, sexually transmitted infection. HIV. Many are aware of the groundbreaking scientific research on HIV transmission and immunology that this team um, generated. But as my own career in public health developed, I, be I became aware of another key dimension of their work in Kenya, the groundbreaking HIV prevention work among sex workers and clients in Nairobi. Led by Frank Plummer, Elizabeth Ngugi, Stephen Moses, Anya Costigan, Larry Gelman, Joshua Kimani, and others, the University of Manitoba, along with the University of Nairobi and other local partners, pioneered an approach to community outreach uh, and education through, peer, uh, through sex worker peers, helping to create a new model for community engagement in HIV prevention. And here's Frank during his last visit to Nairobi where he passed away tragically, um, with some of the sex workers with whom he had worked and, and who he had supported in his career earlier. And a new generation of peer educators that are current, still working in Nairobi. In 2000, I boarded the Rani Ch Chenema Express train to travel to Gokak, a small hamlet in rural in the rural part of northern Karnataka in South India. My purpose was to learn more about the HIV situation in the state and the organizations working in HIV, HIV prevention so that I could prepare a funding proposal for the Canadian International Development Agency. As the train pulled out of the, crowded and bustled, uh, the crowd and bustle of the city of Bangalore and then passed village after village across the rural landscape, I wondered where to even begin. I was a bit uncertain about how, how I would know when the tr train reached Gokak, but a source of much greater trepidation was how utterly unprepared I felt for the challenge of developing a public health project that would have any impact in a large, populous, and diverse country as India. Soon after reaching Gokak, I was meeting with a group of women who were in sex work, and they told me that how they had formed collectives of sex workers in several of Karnataka's districts. And through the collectives, they were providing information and resources to prevent HIV to their peers. They were following a peer education model that followed many of the same principles of the U of M's program in Kenya, but they were underfunded and were unable to, to scale up their outreach and community mobilization pro programs. Over the next several years, with funding from CETA, the University of Manitoba developed and implemented the India-Canada HIV-AIDS Project, 
ICHAP, as, uh, as we fondly call it. Working closely with the state AIDS prevention societies in Karnataka and the northwestern state of Rajasthan, our ICHAP team started to work with non-governmental organizations and sex worker collectives to develop larger scale programs founded on the principles of peer education developed in Kenya and building on the commitment and ingenuity of our team and our community partners. A few years after we started this program, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation launched a major HIV program initiative, um, HIV prevention program in India. And the news spread quickly across India. It was in all of the media. I was in a meeting with the health minister of Karnataka uh, while this news was, was circling through India. And he asked me directly whether I could contact the Gates Foundation team and persuade them to support the HIV program in his state. I made a couple of calls to members of the foundation's design team, whom I had never met. And a but a few days later, they, we were joined on the Rani Chanama Express to Northern Karnataka, Karnataka again to meet with women in the sex worker collectives. Seeing the need, recognizing the capabilities of our ICHAP team, and most importantly, seeing the commitment of the government and community partners persuaded the Gates Foundation design team to support a major scale up of the HIV prevention program for women in sex work, men who have sex with men and transgender communities in South India and particularly in the areas that we worked in Karnataka. Over the next several years, with funding mainly from the Gates Foundation and USAID, the program developed a network of community out outreach programs through non-governmental organizations and collectives that reached and provided HIV prevention and treatment services to more than 100,000 individuals in thousands of spots in hundreds of towns and villages, resulting in substantial reductions in HIV risk and incidents among those reached and in the population as a whole. In addition, the programs focused on empowering communities and individuals and addressing many on uh, and addressing many on the structural of the structural factors that affected them negatively these included sensitizing and training tens of thousands of police personnel to encourage them to protect and not to harm sex workers working with the government to to remove barriers to school education and social services and to proactively extend social welfare programs to sex workers and other marginalized groups Workshops were held with, for local news reporters and columnists in all of the districts to reduce the stigmatizing ways in which those at risk for HIV were often portrayed. And instead of the, the challenges faced and, the, and instead focus and highlight these challenges that they faced and the strength of their collective efforts to prevent HIV. These program components to address the underlying structural barriers and violence were instrumental in reducing violence increasing access to social entitlements, and improving individual and community levels of empowerment. Over the ensuing years, the funding of the programs was assumed by the government of India and state governments, and in Karnataka, a high proportion of the projects are still managed and implemented by community-based organizations led by sex workers. Many of the program models, methods, and tools have been transferred to other countries, and form the basis for global guidelines for HIV prevention in marginalized populations. At the University of Manitoba, our team learned important lessons through that work that shaped how we approach global public health. First, we learned, that the, we learned the importance of genuine and sustained partnership with communities and with government programs. Scaling up programs to have a large impact can't be accomplished by a single organization parachuted in from somewhere else, but, de but depends on designing programs that build on the strength of local organizations and working in partnership with local governments to develop the capabilities and structures to support these programs in the longer term. These can't be short-term commitments, but have to be sustained over long enough periods of time to build trust and to develop a deep no enough knowledge of the context and complexities and to move beyond superficial solutions. Since many funders tend to fund projects for just three to five years, 
forming longer-term partnerships has often meant that the University of Manitoba has had to sustain teams in place to bridge the gaps between funded projects. Second, we as a team learned the importance of assuming accountability for outcomes. When a team from an academic institution assumes accountability for improving the public health program coverage and quality and, and for improving health outcomes at the population level, it fundam fundamentally changes the way we approach our academic roles, particularly in research and training. Our research becomes embedded in programs directly focused on answering questions about how best to design the program, how to understand and address gaps in access and utilization of programs, to measure and analyze gaps in the quality of services, and to identify and study new and innovative ways to address health issues that programs haven't been able to solve. We realize that the real grand challenges should emerge from the real challenges that programs are facing, not from the imagination of a scientist or inventor, disconnected from the responsibilities of improving health outcomes. Similarly, taking accountability or assuming accountability means that our efforts in training need to be more focused on training models that will build the capacity of those um, that will provide leadership in management and research and program implementation where they are needed most. We also need to ensure that our trainees have the opportunities to fully understand what it means to apply their knowledge and research skills to improve health outcomes and equity, and to do so with authentic partnership with those who are engaged in program management and delivery. In early 2020, just before the COVID-19 pandemic emerged, the University of Manitoba Senate approved a proposal for the establishment of a new Institute for Global Public Health this important step affirmed the university's commitment to global public health and provided the foundation for furthering our university's contributions in global health. The Institute builds on the past two decades of global public health work that has included over 60 projects with over $400 million in total external funding. The University of Manitoba's Institute for Global Public Health has a clear mission to improve health equity. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to, a just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. But how does an academic institute like ours contribute towards health equity? First, we try to concentrate our work in regions where the needs are the greatest and on subpopulations that are being left behind. As an example, our work on HIV prevention in India was largely focused on districts which had the highest HIV prevalence and lacked prevention and treatment programs. Similar, similarly, the focus of our projects for improving maternal, newborn and child health and nutrition have focused in regions of North India which have had the highest mortality rates and have struggled to reduce those rates. Within our focused countries and regions, much of our work is focused on supporting programs that reach those who are underserved, including those in lower socioeconomic positions and those that are marginalized and face stigma and discrimination. Much of the Institute's work in HIV prevention has focused on sex workers and persons who inject drugs and on sexuality minorities, including men who have sex with men and transgender populations. In other public health domains, such as reproductive maternal newborn and child health and nutrition, the focus is on analyzing which subpopulations have the poorest outcomes and designing strategies to improve their access to and use of high quality health services. Increasing the Institute's focus, increasingly the Institute's focus is on supporting health programs to systematically improve the effective coverage of health interventions and services. Effective coverage is not a new concept. Tanahashi first published a framework on it in 1978, and which defines and explains that effective coverage is constrained by various factors, including the lack of availability of services across the health system, service delivery platforms that, that lack health personnel and infrastructure to deliver the services, uh, barriers to the utilization of services by the public, 
and the quality of the service that's provided. Gaps along this effective coverage cascade result in suboptimal health outcomes, very often disproportionately affecting the poor and marginalized populations. Improving, health, uh, improving effective coverage and equity at the population level requires a comprehensive approach, including health policy and financing, health systems improvements, training and mentoring healthcare personnel, outreach and mobilization in communities, and addro addressing the social, cultural, and economic barriers that affect utilization of services. Embedded research provides insights into the important gaps and possible solutions along this cascade. And research can also identify and test innovations that can improve the efficiency of the health system in reaching and providing services in an equitable and effective manner. Improving health equity is not a short-term agenda for our institute, and we recognize that it cannot be accomplished without effective partnerships with governments, non-government organizations, communities, and global health bodies. Following the principles of sustained engagement and effective partnerships, the, the Institute focuses on key countries and geographies, and unlike many academic global health institutes and centers, our Institute's global faculty and teams align our efforts to support programs in these places. Currently, our key focus countries are India and Pakistan in South Asia, and Kenya, Nigeria, and Africa. We are also developing a focus on Ukraine and Eastern Europe. From these focus countries, our global teams have been able to extend the impact by providing technical guidance for programs in many surrounding countries. The state of Uttar Pradesh in northern India has a population of 230 million people, which would make it the fifth largest country in the world. 78% of its population live in rural areas. There are over 5.5 million babies born in Uttar Pradesh each year, representing 20% of all babies born in India each year. There are over 11,000 maternal deaths each year in Uttar Pradesh accounting for about 5.5% of all maternal deaths globally. There are more than 180,000 newborn deaths each year in Uttar Pradesh, representing over 6% of all newborn deaths globally. Since, 19, since 2014, the University of Manitoba, with its India-based NGO partner, India Health Action Trust, and funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, established a technical support unit for the government of Uttar Pradesh. With the daunting goal of reducing neonatal and maternal mortality in the state, improving nutrition, and reducing the unmet need for family planning. The UPTSU now has over 1,000 staff working in public health programs at the community, facility, and health systems level to measure, analyze, and respond to gaps in the availability, utilization, and quality of services. As an example, village-based community health workers called ASHAs were trained, mentored, and supported to improve outreach and mobilization of pregnant, pregnant women to access uh, antenatal services. However, as we started this work, it, became, it was soon evident that antenatal clinics were either non-existent or too far for pregnant women in the villages to access, particularly if they were poor. As a result, when the project started, only about 50% of rural women in, in Uttar Pradesh were receiving any antenatal care. So the UPTSU team worked with the government to incorporate antenatal services into monthly village health and nutrition days, which previously had been really only used for routine immunization services. By changing the policy and supporting frontline workers to establish antenatal services at the village level, the proportion of rural women accessing anti any antenatal care increased rapidly and is now over 90% in, across the state. However, the quality of antenatal services remains suboptimal due to a lack of equipment and uneven quality of either of clinical practices of the auxiliary nurse midwives that run the antenatal clinics. So the TSU worked with the state government to train and mentor the nurses to improve antenatal care and to identify gaps in the supply of medical equipment and supplies 
resulting in a rapid and substantial increase in the quality of antenatal care. Um, uh, the result is much improved effective coverage of antenatal care, particularly among the poorest women in rural areas. Similarly, the UPTSU team has worked with the state government to improve effective coverage of care around labor and delivery. A major component is identifying areas where a high proportion of women are still delivering at home and activating community health centers nearby to provide better access to delivery services. To improve the quality of basic, basic intrapartum and newborn care, an innovative nurse mentoring program was designed by our team resulting in improvements in the overall effective coverage of important interventions, for particularly for preventing postpartum hemorrhage and early initiation of breastfeeding. This nurse mentoring program, starting with just 50 nurse mentors in our project, has now been scaled up across the state with over 800 nurse mentors now being deployed by the state government using the nurse mentoring model that our team uh, established. Increasingly, the focus in Uttar Pradesh is on more comprehensive obstet obstetric and newborn care, providing the management of complicated and emergency cases, improving the management of complicated and emergency cases. To address this, the Technical Support Unit has focused on supporting the government to activate first referral facilities through transformative changes in how specialist doctors are recruited and deployed. The TSU has also developed and supported innovative training and mentoring networks between regional medical colleges and public hospitals to improve capabilities of clinical teams to manage emergency and complicated cases. Recently, um, just this summer in fact, the University of Manitoba received a new grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to extend the Uttar Pradesh Technical Support Unit for another five years. During this new phase, a major challenge includes transitioning the capabilities and roles of the technical support unit to the state government and local institutions. This process will entail rethinking and reshaping the role of academic institutions in Uttar Pradesh to focus more on providing technical support for health programs in partnership with government and the public. The University of Manitoba has the privilege of playing the role of an anchor partner in this endeavor, drawing on our experience over the past 20 years in India in formulating long-term partnerships with government and organizations addressing local health needs and making their priorities our priorities. This experience has not gone unnoticed in India. In the past several months, we have been asked by senior officials of national government institutions to consider, the University of to consider whether the University of Manitoba can work with institutions in India to create a model of embedding research and technical assistance into, into public health programs and to develop jointly training programs that will produce leaders for public health programs and health systems management. Two decades after Frank Plummer and his colleagues had pioneered peer-based outreach and education for HIV prevention in Kenya, a team from the Government of Kenya's National AIDS and STD Control Program visited the University of Manitoba's HIV prevention projects in India. They were impressed by the strategic approaches and scale of the programs, but in particular, they were drawn to the way in which the University of Manitoba's team was providing technical support for the government and for non-governmental organizations and community-based organizations. The visit prompted the Government of Kenya to seek funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the World Bank to support the University of Manitoba to establish a technical support unit in Kenya, modeled on the experience from India. The TSU, embedded within the National AIDS and STD Control Program, supported the Government of Kenya to gather and analyze data to develop strategies to scale up HIV prevention programs and services across Kenya for sex workers, men who have sex with men, persons who inject drugs, and others. In addition to supporting the strategic planning process, the TSU helped to develop national guidelines and training and resource materials to ensure that programs were providing comprehensive and effective HIV prevention and care services and combating violence and stigma and discrimination. The TSU also worked alongside implementing organizations to provide mentorship and support in program delivery. 
Over the past several years, the U of M's work in Kenya has focused increasingly on supporting and building the capacity of community-based organizations, training them in the collection, collect, collection and use of data, and supporting them to take leadership in program delivery. Recently, the government of Kenya made another request to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to expand and extend the technical support unit to include all HIV prevention strategies and programs in Kenya as Kenya enters into their next five-year program cycle. And we anticipate that we'll soon be looking to, forward to a new technical support unit in Kenya, expanding on the previous work. The HIV prevention experiences in Ken India and Kenya has led to the development of technical programs in Nigeria too. Initiated through a partnership with the government of Nigeria and the World Bank, the IGPH has been at the forefront of designing epidemiological studies to better understand the HIV transmission dynamics and to use that information to, to design prevention strategies. In addition, the U of M team has worked closely with the government of Nigeria and NGOs and community-based organizations to develop the first set of national guidelines for the implementation of HIV prevention programs for female sex workers in Nigeria. More recently, the U of M's team in Nigeria has conducted a large survey of key populations in Nigeria to better understand the trends of HIV and to guide future, health, uh, future prevention programs. About 15 years ago, the University of Manitoba provided technical leadership to support the government of Pakistan to design and implement a new HIV surveillance program to better understand the epidemic with a focus on populations at risk. Building on that foundation, the U of M has established strong partnerships in Pakistan with the government, with the Health Services Academy in Islamabad. The focus of the work in Pakistan has now expanded to include reproductive, maternal and child health, and more recently, health system strengthening. As an example, building on the community link worker program developed in initially in India, our team in Pakistan implemented an innovative program to train and support community health workers and parents to improve antenatal and newborn care, and crucially, to improve early child development through um, parent-infant um, interactions during the first year of life. More recently, the U of M's team has focused on working with the Health Services Academy and the government of Pakistan to improve the monitoring and analysis of primary care and to document and understand progress towards universal health coverage. Built on the effective coverage framework, this initiative will focus on improving systems to analyze gaps in, in coverage of essential services at the district level. In addition to the research and technical support, the Institute has established academic partnerships with the Health Services Academy in Islamabad, teaching public health courses and mentoring graduate students along with the Academy's um, own faculty. In addition to our country-focused programs, the Institute provides leadership for the countdown to 2030 for women's, children's and adolescents' health. Led by Professor Thies Burma, one of our faculty members, the Countdown Initiative works with a network of academic institutions and health leaders in low and middle income countries to measure progress towards the sustainable development goals in health, with a focus on assessing pro progress towards improved health equity. The Countdown Initiative places a strong emphasis on partnering with local academic institutions and building capacity for analyzing and imp interpreting health data to provide guidance for health policies and programs to improve health outcomes and equity. So far, I have provided a brief overview of the various projects and partnerships established under the U of M's Institute for Global Public Health. There are many more initiatives that deserve recognition, but that I don't have the time to mention today. So in the remaining few minutes of this lecture, I would like to turn to the future. What path might the University of Manitoba take as it seeks to fulfill its academic mission in global health? In many ways, I think the University of Manitoba is at an inflection point in global health. Years of dedicated work by our teams in diverse global contexts have yielded trusted partnerships and, deep, and a deep experience in how to translate science and academic principles to improve health programs. Now we must build on those partnerships 
and experience to create new, sustainable models for research and academic training that don't rely as extensively on short-term project funding. As an example, over the past few years, our institute has developed uh, has, has initiated the development of public health innovation hubs with state-level programs in India. During my recent trip to uh, India, I visited um, our new innovation hub in Madhya Pradesh, which is just undertaking a new project uh, on, um, uh, in, in, a, in a district that's focused on tribal health and tribal health populations there. These innovation hubs are meant to provide a platform for researchers and innovators from various institutions to partner with health programs to address their most important public health challenges. The idea is not to be in a bilateral relationship, but to create an ecosystem for research and, and uh, translation of knowledge into health programs. Global health is also in desperate need of new training models. Instead of following the model of most universities that attract international students to train in global health at their institutions in Europe and North America, the U of M can and should be at the forefront of establishing more innovative training models with partner institutions in our focus countries that emphasize research training that's embedded in, within the context of their health programs. These opportunities uh, are emerging and my recent, in my recent trip to India, several uh, leaders from academic institutions as well as from governments are, were keenly interested in initiating this process with the university. The University of Manitoba can also be at the forefront of integrating global health initiatives with public health issues in our own city and province. This will re require strong leadership and coordination across the faculty and the university, and new partnerships between the university and public health programs and community-based organizations that are based on clear objectives and accountability. Finally, let me conclude by recounting a conversation I had several years ago with Dr. Um, Brian Postel, the Dean of the Rady Faculty of Health Sciences. At that time, he was new in his leadership role at the university as a dean, but he had a clear vision. His vision was that the University of Manitoba's College of Medicine should be known for a commitment to social responsibility. I believe that part of the sense of social responsibility is deeply ingrained in our global health teams who have applied their efforts and skills to improving health equity in their countries. It has been a deep privilege for me to have had the opportunity to participate in that work. Thank you. I think at this point, we're open to questions. And so I don't know exactly what the technology or process is, but I trust that Lisa and those who are listening. So happy to open the floor for discussion. You can say it and I can repeat it. or plant, plant pathogens, pandemics globally and regionally could create significant insecurity. How are we able to improve this public health problem? That's at least two more lectures and I'm probably not the right person to give it, uh, either of them. Um, I think that, um, I think one of the big problems in global health um, is the siloing of um, disciplines, the siloing of departments, the siloing of institutions. I think some of the biggest challenges, including the one um, articulated in, in that question, I think some of those really require multi-sectoral, multi-institutional, even multi-country um, approaches. So I think that um, we, we need to have different types of partnerships. Um, different faculties and, and institutions need to be working together to solve those kinds of things. And so we need different platforms for that. And in a way, it needs to be focused on what the problem is, not focused on um, an individual department's research or, or, or a, an individual researcher's research. It needs to be tackling and defining those problems in, 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 in more complex ways and bringing together the, the full 
capabilities of, of governments and societies and, and, uh, and uh, academia to do that. Next question from Joel. Thank you, Jamie, for sharing your understanding and efforts to address health inequities in disadvantaged populations and developing countries. Can you speak more to the application of your research and programs to addressing health inequalities within developed countries of the globe, such as the inequalities of in indigenous populations in Manitoba and Canada? Yeah, I, th I think that, um, you know, I, I worked for, for, the for the first decade of my career, I worked, uh, I worked in Canada, I worked in Manitoba, first as a general practitioner and then with the provincial government. Um, and then over the, over the next two decades, I worked internationally in, in global context. One of the differences that I see is that in, in, in developed health systems, in developed societies, I guess you could say, in, in, a, in a way, I'm, not, I'm using that, I'm, I'm not trying to be pejorative, but in, in areas where there's more resources, more established processes, um, there's just, there, there's not much creativity. There's not much risk taking in terms of policy, in terms of programs. And so things get ossified. People anticipate that if you just create, you know, enough health systems and pay for health services, that that somehow is adequate. Um, whereas in lower resource settings, what we find is you need to be very deliberate. You need to have you, you need you need to put um, the outreach and the and the and the development of services and the delivery of services at the core of what you're doing, and that means changing what you're doing. It means changing your policies, changing how you structure your health services. What I found is is that in most of the country, the lower and middle income countries in which we work, there's much more risk taking by governments, by health systems, by organizations to try to address these issues than, than there is here. I think we need to be ready to change the way we think about um, uh, programs, the way we think about our health system. Um, and I, I think that that's going to require, um, I think, uh, j just a, uh, a more creativity more and more accountability for results. I, I mean, it's, it's remarkable to me that if everywhere we go, in, in all of our programs, we're constantly looking at measures of inequity, results at the population level, whereas we don't do that so much in, 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 uh, in Canada or in Manitoba. Uh, but I think we need to do that. We need to take that accountability. We're accountable for, pro for program results in India or Pakistan or Kenya. That accountability is really important, and that includes uh, accountability for improving health equity. Next question from David and Barbara. With all your experience and technical abilities, how do you see your role in improving the state of health in our indigenous communities? Well, first of all, I think it, I think it's um, I, I think the, the the notion that having done uh, having worked in a in a context for a while, you can immediately just sort of jump into another context. Um, and apply those um, those principles or those uh, or that knowledge, and I'm not. I think that's simplistic, and I think it it um, uh, it doesn't value the experience and the capabilities of indigenous communities here and those who work with indigenous communities. So I think it's overly simplistic to say that you can take experience from one context and just apply it in another context. There are principles that probably apply, but I think that. Um, I, I think the more important thing is what we've learned in terms of principle is putting the community in the lead in trying to resolve those problems and giving them the resources that they need to deal with that. Um, it's, I mean, I recounted our, our early work in India where community-based organizations were ready and committed to doing things. They didn't have the resources and they didn't have the responsibility. So there are those principles that we can apply here, but I think that um, I think it would be simplistic and it, would, it wouldn't be right for us to think that we can just take global experience and, and use it and apply it in Indigenous communities. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, next question from Kay. Uh, how is COVID impacting your programs within India? 
Um, in a major way. Um, I think that, uh, first of all, I think it's, it's, it's put an enormous stress on people in the healthcare system who are working in the healthcare system, um, just as you see here. But I think there, um, the wave of COVID in India was particularly devastating and it layered on top of resource constraints to begin with. Um, we, we saw almost an immediate reduction in the availability of important services. Um, like the ability, the availability of of, um, of surgical obstetric care, as an example, was was immediately um, curtailed. Uh, we've just done some analysis showing that the rate of full immunization coverage has has dropped by over ten percent in UP just in the last year and a half. So there's a lot of recovery in the public health system that will have to have to uh, occur now. And our team now is has pivoted from supporting the COVID response to supporting the COVID recovery, as it were, to really trying to see how they can get um, critical public health services um, back on track. Okay, and one last question here from Terry. Uh, in your time in global public health, have you witnessed an increase in significant rigor? For example, are RCTs used more extensively as compared to before, after studies? Um, one of my favorite topics as a researcher, I would say that um, we're seeing less and less of randomized trials. I think there, I think in global health particularly, there still are a lot of RCTs because researchers um, and research funding bodies see them as gold standard. But increasingly in global health, the trend that we're finding is that the, um, the limitations in terms of translating the results of a randomized trial in one context into another context are, are, are really critical. And so increasingly we're seeing more and more embedded program science, more quality improvement research rather than randomized trials um, that try to look at, it, at, at a single intervention and try to pr understand its efficacy. We're seeing much more embedded um, complex system types of research emerging in global health. Jamie, let me thank you uh, very much for your presentation. I'd like to introduce Dr. Arnold Neymark to close the session here. Dr. Neymark. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to once again express my gratitude to the class of 1972, wonderful group of people. Uh, students who, with whom I had a great rapport when I was dean and who've done me the great honor of uh, developing a lectureship of, uh, in a topic that has always been of interest to me, although I've all, often been involved with bench science, and that is uh, the uh, medicine and society. And there is no uh, area in which the uh, nature of the relationship between medicine and society is more complex, more challenging, more uh, uh, universal than in uh, coping with uh, what are public health and all of the challenges to it. I'm also very pleased to have heard today's lecture from Jamie Blanchard, who's been a stalwart in uh, advancing the cause of uh, global public health in Canada and abroad, and for emphasizing what I think has been the root of uh, what we, we call the Manitoba model, it's really the Jamie Blanchard Manitoba model, of uh, the embedded scientists. Many of you remember in the Gulf War uh, when there was talk about embedded journalists with armies going around. What uh, the Man University of Manitoba group has been able to show over decades is the value of embedding the research, the community developments in country, where all the action is, and being making oneself part of the system and not just an external observer and uh, policy advisor. And that has been the key to the other great embedding, which is the embedding of the fundamental resources in the communities that allow 
the influence that Jamie Blanchard and others have had to carry on through generations. Uh, he's been a, an outstanding uh, colleague uh, and uh, representative of what is uh, best in medicine in Manitoba, and I thank him so much for an excellent talk. Thank you, Jamie. Best wishes uh, in your future work. We'll close the session now. Best wishes to all of you medical students out there, and we hope that uh, global public health will be part of your future. Thank you.